Welcome to Driving the Lane with Randy Kryenbrink and Chuck Rowe. Now, Driving the Lane. Welcome to Driving the Lane. Randy Kryenbrink, Chuck Rowe, the show where we talk about mostly one thing and one thing only, and that is... Panther basketball. Now, it's important to remind you that although we are the official UNI basketball show for the Panther Collective, our comments may not reflect the feelings of our friends at UNI. However, Randy is a former player. And I'm chairing the Panther Collective's youth basketball camp again this year. So yes. this show is as official as it's going to get. As always. Seen, oh, what's that? Oh, uh, I've seen that on Facebook quite a bit, Chuck. It's it's getting a little bit of traction out there for sure. Oh, that it's getting a lot. Collective. We already have more kids signed up than last year. We have some great wow. sponsors. We have some great uh um scholarship opportunities for kids. I mean, this is going to That's be a cool. lot of fun. That's cool. Very good. Great job, Chuck. As always, we have a great show for everyone this week. Joining us today, Emily Holterhouse and Taryn Warden from the women's team and Jack Watkins, Senior Associate Commissioner for the Valley. And of course, the Financial Architects Quote of the Week. Let's get started. Randy, excited to have with us today two of our favorite players from the UNI women's team. Drum roll, please. Emily Holterhouse and Taryn Warden, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So you are the last guest that we have player-wise for the season, and you got probably the worst drum roll because poor Randy, he doesn't know where the microphone on his computer is, so he bangs away, but... You know, I, the That's effort a goal of, there. A goal, Yeah, we got to have goals, Chuck. So goal, a goal of mine for 2025 is to have a... Uh, well, 2024-25 is to just have some sort of... A, I could just push a button and have a drum roll for so tell us a little bit about where you went to high school. Each one of you tell us about where you went to high school and then kind of that commitment process, um, especially Taryn coming to you and I and deciding to play a little basketball here. Um, yeah, go ahead and talk about it. Um, so I am originally from Nebraska. I grew up in Bellevue, which is about five minutes south of Omaha. And it's a very, um, we have off the Air Force Base. So it's a very heavy Air Force military community. Um, so I went to Bellevue West High School, um, and it was just there were always people coming in and out, and so we got to meet um, we got to meet a lot of new people. And through my recruitment process, um, my dad actually played at Creighton, so his time I think overlapped a few years while Coach Warren was there. Um, so they kind of knew each other from that, um, and they started. The recruitment process with me fairly early. I committed at the start of my junior year of high school. Um, they offered me my sophomore year. Um, and throughout the whole process, they were just very family oriented. Um, this will be a home away from home. Um, and yeah, it was, it was very exciting. I got to uh, join a program with a bunch of people that I love and that love me. And it was, it was a great experience. I think that home away from home is just a big part of you and I in general, because that was a big thing um, that I, that was a big factor for me, like coming into you and I volleyball. Um, the coaching staff just really cares about you off the court, along with on the court. Um, so yeah, just being able to go from, you know, one coaching staff to the other and just realizing that they all really do care about you. Um, it was really cool to see. You were MVC first team in volleyball. and then. You know, during your recruitment time, at any point, did you ever think basketball or was it always volleyball that your goal? Um, no, I, during during my recruitment time, I kind of had my mindset on volleyball. I actually committed my sophomore year of high school. Um, so that was a while ago now. Um, but I I just I started playing club volleyball in I think it was seventh grade and I just fell in love with it. I actually didn't play basketball. Um mm my eighth grade year and then I debated even playing in high school and one of my teammates actually convinced me to go out and then my dad ended up being an assistant coach and so I um I was really happy with my decision to keep playing and I ended up just enjoying the game of basketball more and more every year um at that time though I'd already committed to play volleyball um I was very happy with my decision I loved playing volleyball here um but there were definitely times where I you know, missed the sport of basketball a little bit. So I'm really glad I got the opportunity to play again. So if I get this right, in eighth grade, someone said, do you want to play basketball? You said, eh, 
Sure. <laughs> and now you ended up on a division one basketball team. That's how the story so. goes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to say yes. If it was that yeah. easy every time. <laughs> My goodness. My goodness. Very so, cool. um, but you start helping out the basketball team in practice. Did you do that in past seasons or was this the first year that you did at the practice squad? This was the first year um, after my freshman year of volleyball here. Um, so it was four years ago. I was like, I tried to ask to be a practice player, but somehow I didn't work out. I think it might've been because I was still, um, you know, doing like off season workouts for uh, volleyball and stuff. But this year I tried again and I guess, and it worked out well. So now Taryn, your role on the team is very obvious because you're just flat out really quick. You are one of the fastest <laughs> people on the court. I do Definitely not think one of our a... best defenders. <laughs> she is. Yeah. yeah. There's no off button and defending. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. The defense that you have. Um, I guess my first question is um, how is the, how do you feel like your energy um, transfers to the rest of the team? I've always kind of been a high energy person. I love getting up in the morning and doing things. Um, and I think, uh, especially coming off of the bench, um, my role is if the team is not, if the energy isn't where we need it to be and I go in, then it's um, my job to kind of pick it up, um, whether it be on the defensive end or getting into our offense a little bit faster. Um, but I love it. I love getting, being excited about it. I love hopefully getting the people around me excited about it too. The one thing about this team that just defines you really well is your defense and especially the guards. Um, and it's, it's not just you, Taryn, but it seems like every guard gets like a billion steals per season. I mean, it's just amazing. And so uh, tell us a little bit about Tanya's coaching style for defense um, during practice and what are drills like during on the defensive end for practice? Defensively, co a lot of Coach Warren drill coaches. Ooh. Coach Warren's drills are very intense. Um, they want you to be able to pressure the ball without getting beat. Um, it's a lot of making sure that when you aren't guarding the ball, you're in the correct position and help side. Um, and it's a lot of flying around and rotating and wanting to speed people up. And mm -hmm. from a guard's perspective then, um, since there's so many of you that get steals, is there some sort of pride and competition amongst the guards to figure out who can lock down opponents better? Who gets more steals for the season? Does that any, does that ever come up in conversation? I don't think it's ever been outwardly expressed. I think inwardly, I think we all have a little bit of that in us wanting to be um, the the difference maker on the defensive end, but it's never been outwardly expressed. And in February, Emerson Green goes down. Um, what goes through your minds when you see her go down? And how, um, I'm sorry, let me add to that. How do you challenge yourselves to step up in that situation? I think I was, I remember watching it all happen. I was standing in the, in the corner and um, it was a lot of pain. I, I felt, I felt a rush of pain as um, hearing her scream and watching her go down. Um, and it was really tough. It was hard to be able to stay in the moment as the game continued because obviously you're worried about your teammate. Um, you want her to be okay. But on the flip side, you also want to let her know that you you guys still have her back um, and that you're not going to give up fighting just just because she can't um, mm -hmm. on the, while, she, while we're on the court. So it was a lot of making sure that she knew we would be there for her, whether um, it was off the floor needing rides anywhere or on the floor, just making sure that our season could be extended as long as it could um, so that we could she could still be able to enjoy it with us. Mm -hmm. And I think in difficult moments, too, when that happens, it just takes the whole team to just um, step up, even if it's a little baby step. If everyone takes a baby step up, then, you know, that can somewhat maybe a little bit make up for um the the loss of a player but emerson was she was a stud she was a leader um it's really hard to make up for that loss so uh so let's talk a little bit about your postseason run through the nit right obviously the conference tournament um didn't quite end up like you wanted it to but uh you guys battled really well so talk a little bit about the conference tournament and then go into the uh to the invite to the nit and kind of how cool that was I think the conference tournament, considering how 
our season started, which was not a great start at all. I don't think people right. expected us to be at the spot we were in the conference yeah. tournament as the number four seed. Um, and I also don't think people expected us to make it to semifinal Saturday. Um, yeah. So it was it was cool to be able to overcome all of that. Obviously, we would have loved to make it to the championship. Um, but with everything that we have gone through this season, um, where we ended up speaks a lot to who we are as a team um, and not not letting all the adversity keep us down. Yeah. I thought the conference tournament was a lot of fun, too. You could just tell how much passion each team was playing with, and that was very visible through um, in our game against Drake, I would say. I mean, I didn't get the chance to play, but my perspective sitting um, – from the bench I could just see and observe all of like the passion and the energy that went into that game from both teams honestly um and that's what that's what brought it to overtime that's what made it so exciting and um definitely just a very passionate heartfelt game yeah very cool how about the NIT where how did you find out about the invite were you sitting around as a team or did text messages just fly around I think it was text messages. I was sitting in our basement watching a movie with my roommates when I got the text that we made it. Um, and cool. I I would be lying if I said I wasn't hope like I was sad that we didn't make it to March Madness, but any opportunity to play in any sort of postseason tournament um, and get that extra opportunity to keep playing and doing what you love is is a blessing. So I was also excited to get that invitation. Cool. And none of us really knew for a while actually I mean we just we kept practicing we didn't know where we were gonna play who what yeah. or when um so you know just it was an exciting time just kind of like yeah. waiting around and waiting to see what would happen cool well you end up playing in St. Louis tough loss um it was so close so close and curious what was that final locker room speech like from either players or the coaches um after that game it was a lot of um get keep uh giving us that hope for next year because we have a lot returning next year um and reminding us that we should not be disappointed with um what happened this season how we ended because we did go through a lot um and it was a lot of making sure that we knew that we should still be proud of what we accomplished um who we were and that the losses we experienced didn't define us as a team Lots of emotion too. Um, yeah. I mean, there wasn't like before the coaches walked in and it was just the team, there wasn't a ton of talking, but I think when there, when it's moments like that, you just, you know, what everyone's feeling, you know, that, you know, it hurts a little bit. The loss obviously stung a little bit. Cause it's, cause it was a tough game. We, if we were at our best, we probably could have won that game too. Um, so just letting it sink in that, you know, another season with a really good team is over. Um, it's just a hard thing to, you know, comprehend. Um, but like Taryn said, there was a lot of talk about um, next year too. And just looking forward to that because they're returning a lot of, a lot of really good players. So I'm excited to just be able to see what they can do next year. Uh, so talk about your futures, right? So you're in school, uh, Emily, you're graduating, right? Mm -hmm uh what are you gonna what's your major and what are you gonna possibly do with that yeah my major is um my undergrad was exercise science and the grad program that I'm in is kinesiology and sport performance mm -hmm. um so I'm hoping to be a coach someday I don't know whether that will be of a sport or of strength and conditioning or doing personal training or youth mentorship type things as you can tell I have a lot of ideas I'm not sure what I want to do yet exactly yeah. um but I'll have some time to decide too, because I'm going to play a year of volleyball overseas um, in Europe first. And then, oh, fun. yeah, and then I'll come back in, uh, find a job in one of those fields later. So, and Taryn, what do you, what's your major and, and what do you hope to do with that? Um, right now, my major is biology. I'm hoping to be able to change it to nursing sometime in the near future. Ah. Um, but I want to become a nurse anesthetist, which is like an assistant to an anesthesiologist. Um, and I'm also minoring in Spanish, so I'll be able to um, help people who aren't, who don't have uh, English as their yeah. first language. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Well, on the team, there was one senior that played their entire career at UNI, and that would be Kaylin. Um, the Morgans are fixtures at UNI, right, Randy? And so 
Um, what was something that yeah. you learned from her and what's it like knowing that she won't be there next year? I loved being able to be her teammate. I know it wasn't for long, but I could just see the passion and energy that she had to want to make her teammates better. And that's not something you always see consistently for, from everyone. Um, and I could tell, like, you know, uh, it being your, her fifth year playing a, the same sport, you know, people can start to get, you know, tired and worn down after a while. But even on the days where I knew she wasn't feeling her best, she still wanted to give her best for the team. Um, hmm. still wanted to play with that passion and energy. So that's just something I noticed and it really inspired me too. Oh, and for me, I I was teammates with her for two years and I am more of a soft spoken person, but from Simo, I learned that I shouldn't be afraid to speak my mind regardless of what other people um may think. And that bravery and that strength is something that she 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 will carry with her for a long time. And it's something mm -hmm. that's very admirable. And something that I learned from the volleyball team is that, you know, you have to have leaders who are not afraid to say the hard thing sometimes, because sometimes the hard thing is what will help the team most. And um, as soon as I came onto the basketball team, I could, I saw that in her. Um, that was definitely a quality of her leadership. She wasn't afraid to get on her teammates because she knew that's what would be best for the team as a whole. Well, the funny thing about all of you, and I think um, she had a cat named Muffin, right? I think, Grand, <laughs> we interviewed. And, and the funny thing is, so. is that uh, is that all of you are so like, you're smiling and sweet, but on the court, there yeah. is not a single smile. And 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 it, it actually scares me. I would scare, I'd be scared to play against any of you because you, uh, the seriousness <laughs> and the focus that you guys have on the court is amazing. So Emily, you haven't had as much time with the team, but a question about like, uh, Who's like the biggest trash talker on the team, whether it be practice or a game? Who who would you pick out oh, as the biggest trash talker? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of want to say Maya, Maya McDermott, because um, I mean, you always know she's joking, but I mean, sometimes she'll just like, you know, give you a little kick in the butt, but it's all uh -huh. it's all love, which which is the good part. Is there a player that you don't want to trash talk with? Because if you do, they'll just own you after that. Oh. They take it personal and uh Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think with everyone, um, I'm not the best trash talker, I gotta admit, but I think if I was, I would go at it with anyone on the team. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the coaching staff since the since the season's pretty much over, and which by the way, congratulations. What what a great season. You guys were fun yeah. to watch. Brought some great uh, entertainment to the McLeod this year, and then obviously with your postseason. So congrats on that. That's really, really cool. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit, but let's talk about your coaches for a second. So uh, which coach is the grabbiest in the morning if they don't have their coffee? Honestly, I would say they're more just quiet rather than grabby. Like, <laughs> I mean, like sometimes we'll be in like the film room before and they just kind of all walk in. A lot of them have like their energy drinks and their coffees, but they don't, they don't really say a whole bunch right away, mm, yeah. which I would say is similar to the team too. I think yep. most of the girls need their coffee before they get going for the day. So to go off what you were just saying, Emily, is there a, is there a player though that you'd know, Hey, maybe we just stay away from that person until they had their coffee and wake up. <laughs> That's a funny question. Um, you know, Grace Buffelli and Kayba uh, Lalby are, they're, they're very tight and they both, very much need their coffee you know you always see them walking in and they got their coffee in hand and so you know as soon as they got their coffee I mean they're great regardless if they have caffeine or not obviously but if they have their if they have their coffee then you know they're about ready to go besides sports what's one unknown talent that people might not know about you um in high school I was in a few choirs Okay. Yeah. Let me think. Was that soprano or I was actually in alto? Alto. There you go. There yep. you go. Yes. <laughs> um, did you say outside of sports? Okay, outside I mean, of sports. Okay, yeah. outside of sports. Um, I don't know. I guess this doesn't um count as a sport, but I really like to rollerblade, and I do that often. And oh. I did take a really bad tumble last summer, <laughs> but. I other than that, I would say I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's very <laughs> impressive. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what about on the team who's the best prankster? Is there anyone that's a good prankster yeah. on the team? 
feel like Maya is. Maya is constantly trying to to scare everyone. And when she's really good about keeping a straight face and making you believe whatever she says. So there'll be times she'll say something completely straight faced and she'll let it go on too. She'll let she'll let you believe the prank as, as long as she wants you to. I also think of Katie. Katie Ryerson, oh, yeah. our freshman. There's multiple times where I've caught her being behind a door trying to scare someone. <laughs> and you come around the corner and then she'll jump out at you. So we're playing the game Survivor, right? And you're going to go to this deserted island. You get to choose one coach and you get to choose one player to take with you. Who is it and why? Oh, man. One coach and one player. Um, I think player wise, I'm going to take Rachel Hatela. She, she, she has, she just is the type of person you look at and think she has survival skills. She, okay. used, to take, she used to take Taekwondo. So I, I would feel safe. <laughs> I'm going to support that answer. <laughs> I'm going to go with Rachel on that one. Okay. Um, coaches. I kind of want to say coach Nelson, because I feel like he would just, be able to get things done mm -hmm. like if I need like a tent built he would just build the tent right away and he would know how to do it yeah. yeah I guess I don't know him that well but that's I just feel like he could do that <laughs> I'd say either coach Nelson or coach Oakland coach Nelson has been kind of the go-to for the players in uh -huh. this category for sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah no one goes with coach Warren ever um, no <laughs> no she, she, she just, has she's expressed that she would not want to be brought We've asked this question in the locker room, and she's like, do not choose me. <laughs> well, that settles that. Let me ask you one final question here, and that is, if you look on your screen here, you see that the, the forwards and centers are divided from the guards. If you're playing a game of five on five, who would win a best of, let's say, five series between the guards mm -hmm. and the forward centers? I might be biased, but I'm going to say the centers because we could just, you know, post all the guards up the whole time and just I wish I could jump a little higher but I I could I can't dunk on them but I would surely try <laughs> I am gonna have to disagree with you I'd go with the guards just because we have so many and we'd be able to run up and down really fast oh yeah hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully tire the centers out like you have all these, you know, six foot people you just run around circles around them right is that what you're saying that would be the hope that would be <laughs> no, but running circles around us isn't going to be very helpful if we just swat you every time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, there's a couple of five ten people in that guard care category, but okay. There's a five five. That's pretty tall. Well, right. there's only one way to figure out this situation, Randy. Right. Is true. His next practice, we need to divide up the guards and the forward centers and see what right. happens. Can, Do you can think you Tanya make that happen? Yeah. You think Tanya would let you coach the guards and me coach the centers, or what are we thinking there? Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure she would. I'm not sure what I would bring to the table, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies, your job is to is to work out that scrimmage and then let us Coordinate know. That? All right, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Awesome. Well, That's any awesome. final words to Panther fans before we let you go? Um, I would just say thank you for all the support. I mean, that's a such a big part of um, playing sports here at UNI, just having the support of the community um, behind us. So that's a big thing for me. Yeah, thank you for always showing up. And we can't wait to have you back next year. It's going yeah. to be fun. Very cool. And and once again, once again, Chuck, these two ladies uh, resemble uh, what goes on at the University of Northern Iowa as far as student athletes. And uh, keep uh, being present in the community, doing what you guys do, which is really, really cool. We appreciate it as a, as a grandpa. I appreciate it that you guys are out there smiling and, and being with the kids and always giving them time when they, when they ask for it. So we have a senior associate commissioner of MVC with us, Jack Watkins. Um, do you have any good questions you want to ask Jack before you go? Um, hi Jack. Nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> Um, here watch, I enjoyed watching you guys play in the Quad Cities. So. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, a question for you. What is your favorite sport to watch? Ooh, wow. Tough one. Well, I could say women's basketball. Um, and that would be <laughs> one of them. I will tell you that having worked for the conference for 32 years, picking a favorite sport is like rank ordering your, rank ordering your children. I don't feel <laughs> really comfortable doing that. Yeah, that's funny. Um, because I do each one of them have their own skill level and excitement. I mean, 
uh, certainly a, the final didn't include you and I, but certainly our women's championship game on ESPN2 this year had all the makings of a, a, an absolutely awesome game. How about what is your go-to snack when you get a little hungry? Good question. I would tell you that that if the Lord called me home today, there would be a downturn in cherry Twizzlers for me. <laughs> it ties me over. I, I kind of muscle past the fact that on the package it says low fat snack. When I want something to eat, that's what I get. So. <laughs> that's a good choice. <laughs> well, anyways, I don't know, Chuck. Oh. Chuck, we just need to let these two ladies take over. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I shouldn't have stopped it at one because, uh, you know, do you have any other good questions to ask, Jack? That's all my creativity yeah, think, for the day. No. I, I think I'm tapped out. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. That's well, awesome. ladies, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. <laughs> Bye. See you guys. Take care. Bye. Well, Jack, thanks again for joining us. Always a pleasure sure. to have you with us. Oh, so, absolutely, guys. It's a rite of passage in the spring. <laughs> I'm just yeah. sad that we didn't connect last year. Last year uh, was still, tr I think it was weeks after the tournament was over. It's been a long time since I pulled an all-nighter. Um, and last year for Arch Madness, we had a St. Louis Blues game the Tuesday night for open practice or practice day on Wednesday. So between myself, Kristen Swiderski, and Mike Kern, uh, if you will, the three amigos when it comes to Arch Madness, there wasn't a lot of sleep that took place uh, getting ready for last year's event. This yeah. year, the Blues the Blues had the temerity to have a home game on Sunday, and so there was there was no. Uh, nighttime into dawn move in taking place for arch meds for starters um great postseason tournaments as usual um uh, from an mvc perspective um how did you think things went and what did you enjoy the most about the tournaments well uh you know i thought there was energy in both uh when you have attendance that leads to energy certainly it's not not my primary focus but it does help when you have attendance that does lead to financial reward also um, I would say if I was, you know, going the championships one at a time, certainly the story that Indiana State was this year in the league and continues to be with them advancing to the semifinals of the NIT at uh, Hinkle Fieldhouse next Tuesday. Um, you know, they sold 800 all-session tickets. That's the most they'd ever sold coming into the tournament. Uh, we op had to open the upper deck for the semifinals on Saturday while not everybody turnstile count came to the game the semifinals on saturday all the tickets were sold uh we had about probably somewhere between seven or eight hundred in the upper deck uh had almost nine thousand people in the building on saturday and then the championship game between drake and indiana state on sunday it's quite heartwarming when you're down to two schools one of which is a rather small private school in in iowa that we had almost seven thousand people for the championship game and i know our good friends at CBS were thrilled with the atmosphere that we had. Certainly the conference was from start to finish for the men's championship, but certainly from the CBS perspective, uh, they were very pleased with the semifinals and title game this year. Very cool. Moving to the women's women's side for just a second. So a lot of rumors flying around about the hoops in the heartland. Um, are you able to share anything about the future plans, uh, women's tournament, kind of where it might be going? What's up with that? Well, there's ready. There's been a lot of conjecture about it. Obviously, we've been in the Quad City since 2016. They're really good partners. We did conduct a request for proposal uh, initiative, RFP for short, and and we got responses in February. I think the one thing that I would say is that that our board of directors, which is comprised of our presidents and chancellors. They will look at proposals from from all three of the bidding cities and decide where we're going 25, 26, and 27, certainly mm -hmm. by the middle of April. Um, that's really all I can say at this point. Perfect. I can tell you that the Quad Cities is one of the three bidding uh, cities that we have at this time. Um, and we have two others that are that are very quality. And I know that that one of the big things that a lot of speculation have been about the women's tournament is that there would be a fourth component looking at potentially combining the men's tournaments and the women's tournaments in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that's the place that we're in right now. I think our, our board of directors are looking at standalone events where there would be all 12 teams for each tournament 
going forward. But in, in terms of where we'll be, that I can't I can't answer at this point because it really hasn't been decided. Cool. Well, we already talked about what you thought about the women's tournament in general this year. Um, one of the things that's been a real highlight is, and maybe this kind of stems from the Caitlin Clark effect a little bit. Have you seen a growth in tickets over the past few years for the women's tournament? And have you seen that excitement build up as far as the fan base for MVC? Well, certainly Chuck and Randy, I, you know, the, the, the addition of Belmont, UIC and Murray has been a benefit to us. Uh, certainly Belmont two years in a row is the two seed for hoops in the heartland. Bart Brooks does a great job. Um, you know, two years in a row, they finished second when they had a rather significant injury uh, along the way. Tootie Jones, who was a, just a tremendous defender and great student athlete that played this year, she was hurt just before the start of conference play in 22-23. So maybe they don't share the title with, with Illinois State uh, in 23. This year, Jalen Banks, who was our freshman of the year, got hurt in the weeks leading up to Hoops in the Heartland. It didn't play in the conference tournament. I, I think the influx of energy that, that Belmont's program, particularly him and students, they've traveled to Hoops in the Heartland the last two years has been significant. I, I think having a program like Belmont to go along with cornerstone programs like Drake, Northern Iowa, Illinois State, Missouri State, for sure on the women's side. Um, I, I do think there's a resurgence in the appeal and the atmosphere that we have at our buildings. Our attendance was up this year for Hoops in the Heartland. Um, you know, second straight year that Drake and Northern Iowa play in the semifinals. That much like when Bradley, Southern Illinois, get to the semifinals of the men's championship in Arch Madness, you certainly see a walk-up factor that takes place in addition to your pre-tournament sales. And so, I, you know, I, I think probably the tenants that we had for a semifinal Saturday uh, for Hoops in the Heartland this year, you have to go back to pre-COVID uh, for numbers like we had this year. So, again, for, for the women's championship in Moline and the men's championship in St. Louis, the, certainly from start to finish, there was more attendance, more energy, but it was noticeably different for the semifinal games of the championship game this year. So uh, we're watching selection Sunday, right? For the, uh, for the men's side and uh, Indiana state does not get a bid. Uh, what's the conversations in the, in your guys' uh, office? Well, certainly I'll only speak for myself, Randy and, and Chuck, that I'm looking at things through red, white, and blue glasses. And I'm not talking about old glory. I'm talking about Missouri Valley. Right. Um, I look at I look at the University of I'm just going to say I look I look at the University of Virginia, how they get in. There were at least three schools: Oklahoma, Seton Hall, and Indiana State for sure. In my opinion, that were that were more deserving than the Cavaliers. Uh, I, in my opinion, I think the committee did a big swing and a miss by putting Virginia in the field. Yeah. Uh, I've never been, I've never had the honor to be part of the committee, but when you line up the at-large candidacy. For, for Seton Hall, Oklahoma, and certainly Indian State, the great job right. that they had, the national story that they continue to be, I, I think that was a swing and a miss, quite honestly. When we talk to different Valley officials about scheduling, I mean, this is where some of this comes into play. Um, they always tell you the same thing, that they can't get any Power 5 schools to come to their place because those Power 5 schools don't want to lose. And so... Obviously, when we get closer to that March Madness time, we're we're in a tough position. What sort of discussions does the Valley have with our own schools, as well as the NCAA, to help combat those type of things? You know, Indiana State did play at Michigan State, did not win. They played at Alabama, didn't win in a game that Robbie Avila was not was hurt and didn't play. Um, then you you know Indiana State's midweek losses or lost to Illinois State, and then their loss at Southern Illinois, you know, Jason Kent has, is in concussion protocol. And the committee is, you know, says that they take into, a, into account that, that the injuries, you know, at key parts of the game at, or season uh, will, will weigh in about at-large advocacy. Um, certainly, when you look at, the, look at Indiana State's 
uh, quad one victories. They did not have a quad one non-conference victory. And I'm, you know, the committee chair pointed that out in the announcement on CBS, um, did point to those two midweek or the, the two losses that they had to Illinois State and Southern Illinois. But you're right. I mean, you look at really the way that things are dwindling in terms of opportunities, really the, the only clear cut shot that you have is to get into a multi-team event and quite honestly, one of the ESPN managed ones, whether mm. it's the Diamond Head or, or, or I think now it's, now it's the Anaheim tournament. I can't remember the, whether it's the Wooden Classic, what have you. Um, the ones that are played at Thanksgiving, uh, that's when you have the best shot to get a, a Power Five funded program on a neutral floor. Because otherwise you're going to, you know, it used to be that, that, that if a school, a mid-major was willing to do a two for one, go play on the road twice at one and then finally get up a, a home right. game, uh, that was the way to get opportunities like that. And certainly Southern Illinois did that with Oklahoma State. Um, but, and they, and the Salukis won those games, but, yeah. but those are so the exception to the rule. And it's almost now that you, you, you have to almost look, I wouldn't say you have to have a crystal ball, but you almost have to look two years down the road and look at, okay, can we get in a multi-team event? What are the ESPN ones? And certainly, you know, right now we're, we're in the process of going through our, our, our latest version of the contract with ESPN because our current one concludes uh, June 30th of 24. And, okay. you know, some of the conversations that we've had with the worldwide leader, our inclusion of our teams in at least one, maybe two of their, their ESPN owned and managed events to mm -hmm. give us that necessary opportunity. Very true. And, they, and even looking forward, like the NIT, the NIT is even looking to get more power five schools in that tournament. And so do you see possibly that a little bit of squeeze on the mid-majors uh, and specifically the Missouri Valley schools? That's really, that's a tough question. And I, the reason I say that is that I already look at two factors between NIL and the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. uh, that There are already two rather significant additions to the collegiate landscape right now with which our schools are dealing. And now when you talk about the construction of bracketing for for tournaments historically where a mid-major funded, funded conference has right. the opportunity to participate, it does get it does get significantly harder when you're trying to build an ad large case. Those other two things are in their in their own right are tough to overcome. But now when you're talking about a narrowing of opportunities, yeah, that, I wouldn't horrible analogy, but it's you know, I wouldn't call it three strikes, but it sure seems like uh, it's not necessarily a holy trinity for a mid-major. It's the complete opposite. Well, the, the one major rule that used to be in place is that when you would transfer, you had to sit out a year for the most part. Um, now that that's gone, are those current transfer rules a help or a hindrance from a marketing and TV perspective for you? Well, <laughs> I'll just say this, that, you know, we talked about Arch Madness and the attendance and the energy that 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 we had this year, and it was magnificent. But then, you know, the first day that the what the the day after Hoops in the Heartland is completed on Monday, March the 18th, you look at how many of our young men have put their name in the transfer portal. Yeah, and and certainly, you know, I, one school in particular. I mean, uh, you know. Brian Mullins is relieved of his duties at Southern Illinois. And on the day of the transfer uh, that you can put your name in the portal, th their three returning starters are in that portal. So, I mean, you know, in terms of trying to build momentum on an institutional level, I'll start there. Uh, I have been on campus in a long time, but I can't imagine what it's like right now, you guys, to be a division one coach man or woman where you you know it used to be it was quite a coup you got your student athletes to sign a national letter of intent they're on your campus now you were re-recruiting your team on a daily basis right 
daily, not weekly, not monthly, right. daily. Yeah. And and so, you know, I, as you look to the future in this business, I mean, it's almost like, you know, the director of basketball operations, used to, that role is really to plan out team travel, okay. uh, set up practices, things of that nature. Are, is it going to be one of your assistant coaches now that becomes a surrogate director of player personnel, like you have at a professional sports franchise, where, okay, you're looking at your current construction of your team, but you're always mindful of, okay, kids that are in the portal. Well, okay, suddenly we thought we had recruited two student athletes. I'll just use the sport of basketball. We had a really solid front line point guard and we have the heir apparent men's or women's team well now you almost have to have an eye in there okay do we need to come up with a third option <laughs> I'm, right. I'm serious i mean you know right I, I, our, uh, this is the is is the coaching staff going forward in, in division one for for almost any sport are they going to is the director of operations is that role going to be a hybrid now where it's also looking at player personnel I don't yeah. know what the I don't know what the you know what the nomenclature would be for that position. Right. Uh, but but I just I there are a lot of friends of mine and I consider not just men's and women's basketball, but when you've been around for thirty two years with a conference, with a company, if you will, you make a you forge a lot of relationships. Yeah. And it's interesting when when we're, I'm I'm excited about our softball and baseball championships that are coming up in May. When in between games, you know, you've got infield practice and the countdown to them and coaches are nervously stomping the floor in the dugouts and you have the chance to interact with them. It would be, I, I, you know, those, those conversations are meaningful. What's on their mind and what they're thinking. And I can't imagine that, that in all those, the lead up to the 11 softball games and the 14 or 15 conference tournament baseball contests, that that's not going to come up. Right. And, and again, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think anybody in division one has one quite honestly. Um, but I do think that uh, it used to be roster management was <laughs> the punchline of a very bad joke. Right. It would be, it would be part of running off kids quite honestly. Yeah. Now it, the paradigm is completely flipped. Yeah. now and 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 so yeah, I, I, you can call it uh, uh personnel development whatever the case may be yeah in, in terms of in terms of label but but coaches now are gonna you know it used to be and i'm I, I feel more comfortable talking about the sport of hoops you had a head coach a lot of times the associate head coach would be a trusted person that would not tell you yes in a huddle coach i need i think you need to think about this it'd be a great sounding board well now you're almost going to have to have one of the members of your coaching staff that 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 they're always going to be looking i mean yeah you hit the recruiting trail but the recruiting trail is just one part of it now. right it's right. not it's not it's not high school it's not junior college it's yeah. portal yeah yeah it used to be you know, you might lose some of your players to another school through the portal, but you would get at least uh, maybe one of the power five schools would have a kid transfer um, to a mid-major. So you would almost get that star through a transfer portal. But now with NIL money out there at these power five schools, is there a concern that maybe those reserves don't want to transfer down to a mid-major school anymore? So we might not get those stars in the making any longer at a mid-major. Boy, Chuck, you really have asked me some good ones. That well, you both have. Is it a concern? I, I I would think so. To what degree? I could not say. I mean, you know, it used to be that 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 we have benefited from from Power Five transfers for sure. I mean, yeah. we have. Uh, kids wanted to go play. Kids want to win. Kids want to play and win. Now kids want to play, win, and be rec recognized for their name, image, and likeness. <laughs> so now you have a third component that plays into it. 
you know, I, I wish I, you know, I have no pearls of wisdom in this particular area. Um, yeah. And I, I don't, I, anybody that does, I don't know how, if they really believe in what they're saying. Um, but I look at, I, I look at the future of Division One. I, I mean, honestly, you know, quite, I think you guys have heard me say this before. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer playing the back nine. I'm not playing the back <laughs> six. I'm playing the back four. Now. And so as you look to the, as you look to the, the future, um, particularly for, for, for a mid-major funded conference, you know, collective that is going to be something that, that there's going to have to be an appreciation level yeah. and identifying someone that can help in that space. Yeah. It can't be one of those. I'll get to it when I get to it. It's kind of like those that, that at one time said that video streaming odds oh, are bad. It'll never last. Yeah. Well, I know very few people that don't consume content on their laptop, on their phone, on their iPad. So you, you have to try to stay as relevant as you can. I mean, when the conference launched the Valley on ESPN, there was a recognition of, okay, linear video space is really shrinking for us. How do we stay relevant in that changing uh, frontier? Mm -hmm. And And we had 10 university presidents the trusted conference office staff to 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 spend resources to 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 realize that hey you know linear television is great but but that's not people are going to start there's going to come a time with with the quality of streams that there are how you can reach people and I think the collective Chuck to to come back to your question to what degree our twelve institutions can they're going to have to figure that part of it out and yeah. and is it going to be easy no but anything worth doing is worth doing right and yeah. i i do know that we have 12 leaders on our campuses that are really very brilliant people and it will start from the top down like it does in our conference because our yeah. board of, our board of directors make decisions that shape what we do yeah well, speaking of our conference so we're currently sitting at 12 teams right is there anything uh is there anything to expand the valley that you can that you can talk about? Is uh, obviously we're always looking to get bigger and better. I want to navigate this very carefully. I'll just say this: that that you know, I don't. I think the vision shown by our twelve uh, members of our board of directors. I wouldn't say that they're. I I can't say that they're actively pursuing. That doesn't mean that they're not passively pursuing. Yeah. Um, expansion in our, our recently concluded board of directors meetings in St. Louis during the Thursday of Arch Madness. To my knowledge, expansion wasn't one of the topics on there. That doesn't mean that it wasn't discussed just because it wasn't on an agenda. Right. Um, you know, going from 10 teams to 12 teams certainly led to some, some competitive changes, not mm -hmm. just regular season, but postseason play as well. I mean, on the men's and women's basketball side, we went from a true round robin, 18 games, to now it's 20 games where you play home and home with nine schools and you play one team only at your place yep. and the 11th team you play only at their place. Yeah. Um, you know, the competitive model for Hoops in the Heartland and Arch Madness changed. In sports where we don't play a true round robin like softball, it led to the expansion that we bring all 12 teams to yeah. the conference tournament. So, you know, going above 12, I think I think between NIL and in the transfer portal and other things that have occurred, you'd never say never. But uh, I don't know to the I, – I, I can't say that I am aware of an active – bullish stance on expansion that doesn't mean that our ce our ceos are not at least passively yeah. uh, addressing that i'll just say this those those 12 people are they always have the their eye on the future and i'll leave it at that cool
Well, I know there's a lot of questions that people have on their minds about things like NIL, transfer portal, you know, expansion, things like that. So thank you for, for taking the time to answer those yeah. types of questions. And, and I want to kind of leave more on a, a positive note, and that would be um, what's maybe one or two things that you're really excited about for NBC basketball next year? Well, you know, I, I, I'm an old print guy at heart and we're here on an electronic medium, but, you know, I will tell you, it was a very proud day for our conference on January 25th of this year, announcing a new five-year extension of our agreement at Enterprise Center. Um, most of this morning, I've been going over our, our latest version of our ESPN agreement. There's a lot to like in it. Um, you know, for the last three years, it's been a year-to-year -year thing on whether the women's final would be on ESPNU like it was in, in, in 22 and 23. And this year, for the first time in the history of the conference, that the women's final was on ESPN2. Well, in the new agreement, uh, the women's final going forward will be on one of those two platforms. It won't be a year-to-year -year hope. It will be baked into it. Um, and, you know, the, the, as part of the ESPN is our exclusive national rights holder, but CBS Sports does a sub-license agreement where they do an eight game regular season package in the semifinals of Arch Madness on CBS Sports Network and the title game is on CBS Sports. Well, they they have, CBS has alerted us that they plan on extending that agreement. So the, so the title game of Arch, well, it's nothing is signed currently. It, they have every intention of extending. So that means the championship game of Arch Madness would be on CBS Sports the Sunday before Selection Sunday through 2028 or through 29. Yeah. So, I mean, there's guys, listen, you know, one of the things about, and I've, I've shared this with our marketing and sales staff with, with certainly with the changes that we've had and men's coaches, certainly the, the quality of young men that have put their name in the transfer portal. Um, that is whether we like it or not, that is the new normal for not just the Missouri Valley, but for a lot of mid-major funded conferences. But we have a we have a tremendous place to play our men's championship. We have great national linear partners in EV in ESPN and CBS um, to, to tell our story. Um, we have an NCAA first and second round that we're gonna host in St. Louis in 2026 mm -hmm. at Enterprise Center. We've been around for 117 years because we have always we have always been resilient and resourceful. We we you know we have what, what while we we are not Power Five funded, we have clearly maximized our resources to to tell our story. And with a commissioner like Jeff Jackson, and the vision that he has for a league, I have no doubt that we'll continue to do that. And that's why with I I you know we had a great meeting Tuesday in spite of all the change that's taking place on our campuses and our league, you can't but help be thrilled with some of the longstanding partnerships that we have. And they're, they're, they're partnerships, but they're also relationships. And that's how you build things in this business. And, yeah. and, and we wouldn't be around for 117 years if our brand wasn't solid. And when you think about it, only the Big Ten's been, along, been around longer than us guys. So, yeah. I, I mean, I it's important to not lose sight of that, even while there is change. There's some pretty strong core principles and foundational blocks that we have to, on which to build. Yeah, very cool. Maybe when those ESPN and CBS contracts do end four or five years from now, um, you know, you can always call Randy and I, and we can call the games from our show. And, <laughs> and that could be another way for you to just uh, probably generate millions and millions of dollars. So just just a thought. <laughs> One thing's for sure, the interest would be there. I'm not sure about renting the new generation, but with you two characters, I have no doubt. And you guys are you guys are wonderful ambassadors for the league. Um, not just coming at it from a you and I perspective, but that's people like you and people that are that are fiercely loyal, credible, but loyal at the same time. That's what makes it a, a privilege, not a birthright, to be part of the conference office staff. At least it has been for me and Mike Kern. I mean, Kern has a year on me. He's in year 33. 
Um, we are not grad, we are not Valley graduates. Well, technically we are because our alma mater, Missouri, was one of the charter members of the league back in 1907. But but we are Valley boys and will be to the day they carry us out of here. And we feel very strongly about the brand that we represent. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We we have built a great brand and without you guys uh supporting it and doing it it wouldn't happen and it's kind of like having a little bit of insider trading information chuck to have jack on our show and that's uh that's kind of cool so we appreciate the time you take with us always knowledge um and like you said we we've got to embrace some of this stuff and move forward with it uh, because it's here to stay now I, hey chuck i'm going to throw in the uh, financial architects quote of the week because Jack brought this up. So here at the end of our show, Jack, we end up with a financial architect's quote of the week. All right, here it is. Each morning you have a choice and a chance. That's my quote of the week right there. And I think you, you appropriately kind of talked about that, right? Each morning you get up, you have a choice and you have a chance. Well, I, I choose to look at it half full as opposed to half empty myself. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. I'm I'm with you on that one. That's cool. That's cool. Jack wasn't going to get through the day today, but after that quote, he's he's through it. He's, he's going to make it now. He's ready to go. Yep. So. Yep. And I got and he, news for he you. If he, we if we're ready to move in for the sequel for Arch Madness, I'd get our people fired up and we go do it again. That's right. That's right. He's he says he's on the back nine. Not only in the back nine, he says he's like on the back four holes. I I don't think so. I think uh, I think you just made the turn, my friend. <laughs> 